Yes. Uh, good morning, members. Um, this is the uh, House Health Committee hearing of pro-life, uh, pro-abortion issues. Today we will be addressing fetal experimentation. And uh, we have four testifiers. I would like to say that we will adhere strictly to the time frame. So if you have a question and you don't have the opportunity to ask it because of the time frame, you can always submit it and we will try and get an answer uh, for you from the testifiers. So uh, at this time, uh, if we could quickly go around the room and introduce ourselves. I am Kathy Raff, I am from Warren County and I am the chairman, majority chairman of the health committee. Representative Frank. Uh, Representative Dan Frankel, Allegheny County, minority chairman of the health committee. Tim Twardzik, uh, the 123rd, Schuylkill County. Paul Schemmel, portions of Franklin County. Tim Bonner, uh, portions of Mercer and Butler Counties. Clint Owlett, uh, Tioga County, parts of Potter and parts of Bradford County. Jessica Benham, Allegheny County. Ben Sanchez, Montgomery County. John Hershey, Juniata Mifflin and Franklin Counties. Uh, thank you, members. I don't think at this time we have any members online. Uh, I have reminded the members that we will adhere to the uh, time frame. Uh, before we start uh, with this issue, and I know it's uh, controversial, uh, but I did want to read from the Abortion Control Act, the legislative intent. It is the intention of the General Assembly of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to protect hereby the life and health of the woman subject to abortion and to protect the life and health of the child subject to abortion. It is the further intention of the General Assembly to foster the development of standards of professional conduct in a critical area of medical practice and to provide for development of statistical data and to protect the right of the minor woman voluntarily to decide to submit to abortion or to carry her child to term. The General Assembly finds as fact that the rights and interests furthered by this chapter are um, not secure in the context in which abortion is presently performed. So at this time, um, Dr. Altman, I thank you for being here. And I think Dr. Rich is also on the line. Dr. Rich, if uh, I, uh, I under, the, yes. under the rules of the House, I will be swearing you in. If, okay. Uh, I see that you're there. We don't have your video, but I have your initials up on the screen. So, Great. Okay. So if you could both please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is true to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? If so, please indicate by saying, I do. I, I do. do. Okay. Thank you, um, and we truly appreciate your <laughs> willingness to be here to provide testify uh, testimony today to the committee. So at this time, our first testifier is Dr. Kathy Altman, who uh, is an OBGYN, and she is with the Charlotte Lozier Institute uh, and is an associate scholar. So Dr. Altman, uh, please proceed with your testimony, and then if time allows us, we will have some questions. Okay, thank you. I'm, it's a real honor to be here. Um, I'm actually retired now. Um, I was a board certified OBGYN and a former abortionist. Um, I'm currently a life fellow with the American College of Obstetricians and uh, Gynecologists, and I belong to the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. I've uh, testified on issues related to abortion um, in state courts and legislatures and before Congress. Although I now reside in Florida, I was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, I've spent my entire career as a woman's advocate. I have had an abortion and two vaginal births. I have done first and second trimester abortions, and I've treated women with the medical and psychological complications of abortion. 
I've cared for women and their babies throughout normal pregnancies, medically complicated ones, and those with fetal anomalies. I've taken care of women who decided to keep their unplanned pregnancies and those who were born. I also have a cousin who survived an abortion. When I entered medical school, I believed that the availability of abortion on demand was an issue of women's rights, the right to choose. I felt that a woman ha should have control over her body and not be forced to bear a child she didn't want. My commitment to women's issues was strengthened as I was exposed to the discrimination inherent in medical school and residency and the plight of the impoverished women we served in our program. I also believed it was wrong to believe to bring unwanted children into an overpopulated world where they might be neglected or abused. During my residency, I was trained in first trimester abortions using the DNC resuction technique now called aspiration. I then sought special training in second trimester DNE procedures during which the fetus is removed in pieces with special forceps. This is now called a dismemberment procedure. After each procedure, I scrutinized the tissue to account for all the body parts to ensure that nothing was left to cause infection or bleeding. The products of conception were sent to pathology to document the presence of the fetus in the placenta. I was fascinated by the tiny but perfectly formed intestines, kidneys, and other organs, and I enjoyed looking at their incredible cellular detail under the microscope. Because of my training and conditioning, a human fetus seemed no different than the chick embryos I dissected in college. I could view them with strictly scientific interest devoid of, my emotion, of the emotions which I would normally view a baby. I wasn't heartless, I just had been trained to compartmentalize, to compartmentalize these things. If a woman came in with a wanted pregnancy and had a miscarriage or a stillbirth, I felt her pain. The difference in my mind was whether the baby was wanted or not. After my first year of training, I got my medical license and was able to get a job moonlighting at a women's clinic in Gainesville, Florida, doing abortions. I reasoned that although the need for abortion was unfortunate, it was the lesser of two evils, and I was doing something for the well-being of women. I could also make a lot more money doing abortions than I could make working in an emergency room. I enjoyed the technical challenges of doing abortions at later gestations and prided myself on being excellent at what I did. Doing abortions at higher and higher gestational ages became a challenge. The only time I had any qualms about what I was doing was when I had my neonatal care rotation and realized that I was trying to save babies in the NICU that were the same age as babies I was aborting. Still, I rationalized it and was able to push it, the feelings to the back of my mind. In my last year of residency, I became pregnant but continued to do abortions without any reservations. The first time I returned to the clinic after my delivery, however, I was confronted with three, three cases that broke my heart. I had finally made the connection between fetus and baby. I realized that I could no longer kill babies just because they weren't wanted. Few doctors can continue to do abortions for very long. OBGYNs often experience a conflict of interest because they are usually concerned about the welfare of both their patients, but in abortion, they're killing one of them. Although many seeking abortions see the pregnancy as just a blob of tissue, the abortionist knows precisely what they are doing because they must count the body parts after each procedure. Eventually, the truth sinks in. Even though I couldn't stomach doing abortions myself anymore, I continued to be a staunch supporter of abortion rights. My views changed as I saw women in my practice do exceptionally well after keeping their unplanned pregnancies, contrasted with those struggling with the emotional aftermath of abortion. I will never forget one woman who came to see me for prolonged bleeding after an induction abortion. She was still struggling with the horror of delivering her live 20-week-old baby into the toilet. Her baby brother had drowned and she couldn't forgive herself or get the image out of her mind. It wasn't until I read an article that compared abortion to the Holocaust that I completely changed my opinion. 
The article resonated with me because during World War II, my father was present when the first concentration camp was liberated. I grew up with those stories and pictures. I always wondered how the German doctors could do what they did. As I thought about my previous actions and behavior, I understand how the Nazis could exterminate so many people and physicians could justify the cruel experiments they performed in the name of science. Just as I did not consider fetuses as humans, they did not consider the Jews as human. Imagine the horror I felt when I realized that I was no better that they, than they were, and for the first time saw myself as a mass murderer. Everything about abortion has become so distorted that the truth is no longer recognizable. Abortion is big money, and those who profit from it lobby to prevent any restriction on it. Our language concerning abortion has become sanitized. We don't speak about the baby, but instead talk about the fetus. The abortionist terminates the pregnancy rather than kills the baby. As medical doctors and as a society, we have moved away from the idea that life is precious and closer to the utilitarian attitude of German physicians before World War II. We have shifted our priorities from fundamental human rights to women's rights and have taught our young women that nothing should interfere with her right to do what she wants with her body, especially when it comes to pregnancy. Some even feel that a woman should have three months after the birth to decide if she wants to euthanize her baby since some defects may not be evident at birth. When I did abortions, my colleagues and I used every available loophole to make abortion available to anyone for any reason. Although our standard line was our concern for the mother's health, our real goal was to get rid of the baby. When I did obstetrics, however, I did everything I could to safeguard the health of both the baby and the mother. I never had a case where I had to choose between saving the mother's life or the life of the baby. Doing an abortion late in pregnancy took too long and was riskier than inducing the baby early or doing a C-section if the mother's health was at stake. I first heard about the DNX procedure, later known as partial birth abortion or intact DNA, early in my career when I was still very pro-abortion. I didn't understand why those using the technique weren't, technique weren't arrested for murder. After all, the baby was already in the birth canal and they killed it. I wondered why they didn't just wait a few more weeks and let the baby live. The mother had gone through most of the pregnancy already, and at that point, delivery would be the safest option. <clears throat> I realized that DNX was the perfect technique for harvesting organs and worried it would become a driving factor for late abortions. Although my concerns were discounted at the time, we now have video evidence and sworn testimony that this technique is being used by those who provide fetal organs for research. If the abortionist overdilates the cervix prior to the abortion, it is possible for the fetus to be accidentally delivered intact. Since the fetus has not been dismembered, it is also possible for the fetus to be born alive. According to sworn testimony and video evidence, those who procure fetal tissue and organs for research need the tissue to be fresh. They don't want the abortionist to administer digoxin to cause real death because it damages the tissue. Instances where organs were harvested from babies while their hearts were still beating have been documented. <clears throat> For years, abortionists and prominent physicians have argued that the fetus doesn't feel pain. However, the evidence is now clear that preborn babies feel pain by 20 weeks gestation and likely at much earlier gestations. Although ACOG came out with a statement disputing that the fetus feels pain, the main proponent and opponent of the theory collaborated on a paper looking at the neuroscience of fetal pain and concluded there is evidence that the fetus can feel pain from as early as 12 weeks. This is corroborated by the fact that anesthesiologists routinely administer anesthesia to the baby and the mother during fetal surgery.
this is done not only to keep the baby from moving, but also to provide pain relief since it improves fetal outcomes. Pennsylvanians were stunned when news broke about the taxpayer-funded research at the University of Pittsburgh involving grafting fetal scalps, back flesh, and other tissue from aborted fetuses onto humanized mice and rats to study the immune system when the skin is infected. Studies involving grafting the fingers of aborted babies onto humanized mice at Stanford University to regenerate cartilage were also disturbing. What is particularly upsetting is that these fetuses were aborted at 18 to 20 weeks gestation, a time when we now have credible evidence that these babies are pain. Although digoxin or potassium chloride can be administered to kill the fetus prior to the abortion, the abortionists may choose not to administer them because researchers need fresh tissue in order to do this kind of research. April 16th, 2021, HHS reversed its 2019 decision to review all grants and contracts proposing the use of aborted fetal tissue by an ethics board. The HHS secretary was quoted as saying, we believe that we have to do the research it takes to make sure that we are incorporating innovation and getting all of those types of treatments and therapies out there to the American people. To paraphrase, the ends justify the means. <laughs> Pennsylvanians cannot rely on the federal government to stop these sorts, of, these sorts of abuses. Please open your hearts and minds to see what is really going on. You must pass legislation to protect your unborn children from these intolerable atrocities. If you don't, you're complicit. <laughs> You will be judged on how well you care for the weakest of our members. And I have to say that there was a time that I would have been thrilled to be involved in those sorts of experiments because I didn't see this as a person. But um, you know, 30 some 40 years later, um, knowing what I know now, I, I cannot. Um, I cannot conscience these kinds of actions. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. And you mentioned the turnaround uh, and the difference between the two administrations in Washington. And uh, under the former administration, the funding for fetal e experimentation was cut. Am I correct? Yes. And, and then under this uh, current administration, uh, I have an article in front of me that says uh, that the uh, current president gives the abortion industry $467.8 billion uh, for fetal research. Um, so I guess the difference between the administrations is that the current administration is encouraging more and more fetal experimentation, and uh, certainly they increase the funding for that type of practice. So, yeah. I, like you, find it very disturbing. Uh, but I'm going to turn to the members to see if any of the members have questions for you. We have about 10 minutes. Uh, uh, Chairman Frankel? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. A um, couple of comments, really, and then, and then a question. First of all, I completely object to the characterization of a uh, safe, legal, medical procedure that is available to women uh, seeking their reproductive health care and exercising their rights, comparing it to the extermination of the Jewish people during the Holocaust. And it's extraordinarily outrageous. And, uh, and I take great offense uh, to such a characterization. Um, you are under oath, and you're making very extreme statements. And I'd like a yes or no answer to this. Do you have any proof that doctors are choosing procedures based on fetal tissue, or is that 
just speculation? Um, I think there's been sworn testimony to that fact. So you're saying, yes, you have proof. I don't have proof, but there is proof. Thank you. Chairman, um, Representative Zimmerman. Um, is it is it possible that I can, s you can see me, but I can't see anyone. Is it possible for me to see the video of the uh, committee room? I believe your video has frozen, um, so you would have to log out and log back in. Uh, but I haven't asked you to do so because we only have about 10 minutes left with you. Okay. okay. I, I apologize for that glitch, Dr. Um, Representative Zimmerman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Altman, for your uh, testimony. Uh, very, uh, very compelling. Um, just one, one question. When you were involved, uh, you had mentioned the dismemberment uh, abortion uh, methods. Are they, in your, from your knowledge, are they still pretty much the very same practices that uh, that you were involved in today, or has that changed? Uh, do you do you know? The procedure really hasn't hasn't changed. You you basically reach in with a um, forceps after the cervix is dilated and pull out whatever you can, usually arms and legs. Then you try to crush the head and then crush the thorax to bring them out. But if you dilate the cervix enough, you can um, get away without um, crushing the thorax possibly and, and sometimes even um, you can pull it out intact. Wow. Thank you. Appreciate uh, appreciate the comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Representative Thank you. Bonner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Altman, uh, for appearing today and providing very important testimony. Unfortunately, uh, when you are talking about uh, the administration of anesthesia uh, in prenatal care um, uh, to the fetus. Uh, your statement was somewhat garbled, and I was hoping that you could revisit that issue um, and tell us particularly at what point in time that anesthesia would be administered to the fetus in any uh, prenatal care uh, for the mother. Well, it, it's not so much in the uh, prenatal care of the mother, but um, we now can do amazing things and can operate on babies in utero. And those, um, initially, they were not given anesthesia, um, but they found that they had to give anesthesia or the babies didn't do well. And so not only were they given anesthesia in order to keep the baby still so the surgeon can operate on them, but also to provide analgesia um, because the outcomes were much better. Um, the heart rates, blood pressure, and everything were much more stable um, if they gave um, actual analgesia to the to the fetus. And uh, what point in time would uh, the anesthesia be administered uh, to the fetus? At uh, how early in the birth process? Well, well, um, they're not being born at this time. Um, but are you talking about how old they were, yes. the gestational age? Yes. Um, well, I know at least at 20 weeks, and I'd have to look it up um, now to see what the latest recommendations are. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Appreciate your uh, time and your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Sanchez. Good, good morning, Doctor. Um, you uh, you mentioned that you were retired, and you had mm -hmm. spent a uh, a number of years working for the Charlotte Lozier Institute. Is that correct? Um, yes, a couple of years. And their mission statement is to ensure that the quote scourge of abortion will be diminished and ultimately overcome. Is that is that correct? Well, you know, <laughs> I'm not familiar with that. I know that uh, they're. Um, 
you know, their uh, research and education group. Okay. Um, were you compensated for your your role at the institute? Um, the institute will pay my uh, travel expenses if I if I um, go to testify and that kind of thing. I was not compensated for what I'm doing today. Have you been compensated for your testimony over the years in, in courts and the like and, and speaking engagements? I, I have been at times, not always, but I have at times. And was, was that your primary occupation? Well, I'm retired. And so it's something that I have done since I've been retired. Okay. And uh, when was the last abortion procedure you performed? Um, let me see. Um, back in the back in the late seventies, early eighties. Thank you. And in in your appearances before courts. Um, have you been qualified as an expert? I have been qualified as an expert. Have you ever not been qualified as an expert? Yes, um, one time in Florida, my home state, um, the judge decided that my um, that my experience was too old, which is interesting in the because of the fact that the procedure has not really changed. Did you have a similar experience with a federal judge in Iowa in 2002, refusing to certify you as an expert in obstetrics or abortion? I actually don't remember that. Okay. And did you concede to a, before a congressional hearing, uh, that you're not an expert in fetal pain during a 2002 congressional hearing I'm, I may not be, a, a, I may have said I was not an expert, but I can read as, an, as well as anyone else well, in this area. And, I'm, and I certainly have um, I studied. Think, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It was glitching there. But I would think an expert would have a, a higher level of expertise than an, the average person. That's actually the very definition of an expert. Um, but uh, I'll leave it at that. It, Thank you, Madam Chair. No further questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Benham, and we have uh, two minutes before we move on. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Altman, and Representative, you may submit your question, and we're trying. I, I also want to point out that uh, Dr. Altman is uh, uh, an OB-GYN physician, did perform abortions, did deliver babies, so uh, maybe in some people's opinion, doctor, you're not an expert on a uh, civil uh, witness stand, but you've certainly been called to testify, I believe, for Congress and, like you said, for states, including this hearing, and we value your opinion and your input, and I thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, since we have a couple minutes, I'll acknowledge um, uh, that State Representative Kinsey is with us, uh, Representative Don Kiefer, Representative Eric Nelson, who's not on, on the committee, but we appreciate you attending the Health Committee, uh, Representative Mary Jo Daly, who also is not a member of the committee, but uh, chose to come to hear the testimony. And three online is Representative Andrew Lewis and Representative Jim Cox and Kate Klunk. So thank you, members, for joining us. And again, uh, thank you, doctor, for being with us today. And uh, we truly do appreciate uh, your testimony and your very heartfelt uh, uh, statements. So at this point, um, we will go to our next presenter who is Dr. Jeremy Rich, who is with the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And doctor, you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you. 
Uh, good morning, Majority Chair Rapp and Minority Chair Frankel and other members of the committee. <clears throat> I appreciate the opportunity to testify uh, before you this morning about the important life-saving research being done with fetal cells and fetal tissue. As a way of background, I'm a neuro-oncologist. I treat patients afflicted with brain and spinal cord tumors. I currently serve as Professor of Neurology and Deputy Director for Research uh, of the Hillman Cancer Center. Uh, I completed medical school at Duke University uh, in 1993. I then completed my residency at the Johns Hopkins Hospital and then uh, subsequently returned to Duke to uh, complete a neuro-oncology fellowship in the joint faculty, remaining there until 2008 when I moved to Cleveland Clinic as the chair of the Department of Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine. I also served at that time as the co-director for the National Center for Regenerative Medicine. In 2017, I moved to the University of California, San Diego as professor of medicine in the Division of Regenerative Medicine, as well as serving as uh, the leader of the brain cancer um, neuro-oncology group, as well as the Brain Tumor Institute, and also a leader in the Cancer Center. In January of this year, I joined the University of Pittsburgh uh, I'm proud to say that uh, collectively, um, the work that I've done has been recognized as being highly impactful, and I rank among the top 1% of scientists in terms of citations worldwide. I'm honored uh, to speak today as I recognize that we all serve our communities in different ways, uh, but share the goal of improving the lives of the people we serve. Today, I hope to provide you with information so that we can collectively find some common ground to advance medical science within a strong ethical framework. Sadly, nearly all of my patients die from their disease, and there have been almost no effective therapies developed in decades. Over time, I have focused my efforts on developing new treatments against the most resistant tumor cell population that display similarities to stem cells, specifically neural stem cells derived from the brain. To develop ways of targeting these cancer stem cells, as we call them, uh, we have to develop therapies that kill these cells, but not normal brain stem cells. I, my group does not use fetal tissues, but only neural stem cells derived from embryonic stem cells or fetal stem cells uh, that will grow over the long term. My group was the first group to represent brain, uh, to develop a uh, brain tumor organized. Uh, commonly called mini brains or brain tumors, um, which we have used to develop uh, novel therapies and approaches, including uh, showing the efficacy of a modified Zika virus as a way to kill these cancer stem cells while sparing normal brain. Uh, like many viruses, Zika infects human tissues very differently than other species, and therefore we have uh, compared the effects of uh, Zika that has been modified uh, against human brain tumor organoids and compare those to human brain organoids. It's my privilege now to provide you with an up-to-date uh, and state-of-the-art information about the important value of fetal tissue and cell research. My message is simple. Fetal tissue and cells that cannot be, uh, cannot be replaced by embryonic stem cells, reprogrammed stem cells, or adult stem cells. Frankly, these other cell types do not produce cells with identical properties as those from fetal sources. As many of you know, fetal tissues have been instrumental in the development of a number of therapies. For example, infectious diseases like HIV AIDS, cancer, and many neurologic diseases, which I've been involved in. While many of us in the stem cell field have been very excited about the advances in generating specific cell types from a variety of new technologies, these parts remain simply uh, parts of a uh, complex system. Uh, for example, this would, when we can develop certain cell types, this would be equivalent to handing uh, someone a steering wheel, an engine, and a few other parts and ask them to build a car. The beauty of development requires complicated and sustained dance that still elude us. We are not able to generate the kinds of issues that are complex that are seen in development. The generation of new systems, like induced pluripotent stem cells organized and directed differentiation, led to new understanding, 
but these methods are far away from the complex tissues that are only found in uh, whole organisms. Uh, you have, may have heard uh, we should be able to use cell or computers to solve these issues. I can assure you that every scientist would rejoice if we had true replacements for these tissues. Unfortunately, to quote Donald Rumsfeld, uh, there are uh, some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns. We frankly just are not capable right now of understanding how to really replace the full tissues that uh, are important in terms of human health. I'd like to call out the fact that through our collective efforts in the medical field, the lifespan of uh, the United States residents has doubled in only 200 years. But there are many issues that have not been solved to make people live uh, not only longer, but better. <clears throat> uh, my time in Pitt has been relatively brief, but I can assure you that uh, rigorous laws, regulations, and guidelines um, are being followed by scientists at Pitts and elsewhere to use the fetal tissue to construct models to study HIV AIDS and cancer and test drugs for these conditions uh, for safety and efficacy. By using fetal tissue and research, Pitt scientists have helped protect mothers and babies by improving understanding of how the placenta protects fetuses against viral infections. To address some confusion or errors that may have been communicated or will be communicated, I would like to note of, uh, a few of the following issues. Uh, the the Pitt Biospecimen Court does not obtain tissue from Planned Parenthood or any other source other than UPMC facilities. In cases where fetal tissue is being donated by someone receiving an induced abortion, consent for donation is always discussed and obtained only after the patient's consent for abortion. In other words, only after the patient has consented to the abortion is donation of fetal tissue even discussed. No patient is ever approached for fetal tissue donation before the decision to terminate the pregnancy is made. Yesterday, a video was released regarding pit research. Unfortunately, there are errors in this video that I hope to address briefly. The video of liver cultures from fetal tissue was incorrectly attributed to pit researchers. The research on human fetal uh, cell isolation was conducted only in Palermo, Italy. No work was done in the United States and no U.S. federal research dollars were used for the work. Rather, the research on culturing of liver uh, cells was supported by a grant from UPMC. This was a process of development of good manufacturing practice. And the video that was presented is incorrectly attributed to the University of Pittsburgh research. Uh, I will further note it. These uh, studies are no longer being done and have comp been completed in uh, 2013. The skin studies that have been mentioned already this morning were designed to improve, uh, to address improved vaccination. As we recognize only too well today, vaccinations represent some of the greatest advances in medical care. But despite these challenges, safe and effective vaccines are a challenge. Uh, I will tell you that the vaccinations for smallpox were administered in the skin, and the goal here was that pit researchers would be able to improve vaccinations from the skin. No state appropriation goes to funding any of this research. The university receives federal funding, which is strictly regulated. Fetal tissue has saved thousands of lives and it plays a critical role in uh, combating and curing many of our um, most devastating diseases, including the neurologic diseases and cancer that I treat. I'd like to conclude by saying that I'm pleased that this committee has great passion to support outstanding medical research in the state of Pennsylvania. And we must always challenge ourselves to adhere to the highest ethical standards. Many thoughtful efforts have confirmed that research with fetal tissue and cells that would be otherwise discarded is ethical, valuable, and vital to ongoing biomedical projects. If we do not continue to use this tissue that is destined to, to be discarded, we forgo the opportunity for research to continue to make timely and significant progress in mitigating, if not eliminating, devastating diseases like Alzheimer's disease, cancer, and virus diseases. I'd like to thank the committee for allowing me this opportunity to share researchers' perspective on the importance of fetal tissue and cells to biomedical research. Chairwoman Marap, I'd be pleased to respond to any questions you or the members, other members of the committee might have regarding my research. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, and thank you for your willingness to appear before us today. Uh, I would just like to comment, uh, Doctor, that even funding from the NIH 
uh, is uh, supported by Pennsylvania taxpayer dollars. So whether it's federal or whether it's state dollars, if it's from the NIH or other entities that receive Pennsylvania taxpayer dollars, it is taxpayer funded research. Um, and many of us here sitting here very much appreciate the University of Pittsburgh. However, I think many of us disagree on this um, uh, uh, situation that uh, we see going on at Pitt. Are you familiar that there was a, a, a letter or an article written by um, a Ben Zeisloft, who is the Pennsylvania C Senior Campus Correspondent to the university? Are you familiar? Uh, I'm afraid I'm not, okay. no. Uh, it, 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 um, it uh, is an article regarding the co-engraftment of human skin uh, on uh, the mice and rats at the university where the uh, scalps are removed from the uh, aborted babies and sewn on uh, to the rats. And I, I would... They're mice, actually. They're not rats. What, mice, rodents, okay. We'll use the term rodents. Um, Great. Um, so... Yes, this letter was uh, written by um, Mr. Zeisloff, and it was actually uh, published on January 11th, 2021, so it's recent. Uh, but when you said that the doctor who performed the uh, experiments in Sicily is uh, no longer with you... Uh, Minute. Uh, I'm, just as a correction, I'm sorry. Just uh, so So the... The uh, person who did the actual studies is in the United States. They are not the ones who did the abortion-related procedures. What they were doing is the cell purification procedures. So, there are two. You know, so research in general is performed as a team approach, much like what you do. And so, uh, there can be different tasks that are performed by different individuals. So. The activities by the University of Pittsburgh researcher were performed uh, separate. They were simply uh, performed on um, liver tissue, not anything to do directly with any kind of aborted fetus. Okay. So uh, what is your source then of aborted uh well, I, 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 I don't have an aborted source. So, again, the University of uh, the UPMC um, service provides the tissues, and only UPMC facilities provide tissues uh, to, to pit researchers. Um, so uh, there may be instances where qualified commercial vendors can sometimes uh, perhaps provide, but again, you know, speaking from my own experience, <clears throat> I, I don't use fetal tissues. I use fetal cells that are commercially available and have been uh, used for many, many years, decades. So, so you have not been directly involved in in this uh, particular uh, research that I've referenced. The, the that is correct. I am. I first off, I'm I'm relatively new to the. Uh, the state of Pennsylvania, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to join you today from Pennsylvania. Um, I, uh, but I personally uh, have not done these uh, fetal tissue research. Uh, I have uh, gained benefit in terms of the knowledge from uh, the work that's being done. Uh, but uh, my work, again, is I'm a neuro-oncologist, so I compare uh, brain cancer and normal brain tissues. Thank you. I'm. Um, thank you, uh, Doctor. Uh, I believe Representative Clunk has a question for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us today. I, I have a couple of questions. Sure. And I, and, and I guess so. You're. You just mentioned that you do. You don't really operate in the fetal cell um, experimentation. Area. Is that correct? Um, no, no, that's not entirely correct. So I, I don't use tissues. I use fetal cells. cells. So yeah, so um, that is is seems like a minor distinction, but you know it is important because tissues have three dimensional structure and complexity. 
Um, so I myself uh, don't use tissues that are fully formed, but we do use cells that are from uh, previous either, excuse me, fetuses or embryonic stem cells. Okay, so could, and and maybe you can't do this because of you know your practice area, but could you walk us through from from start to finish from when you know the the mom comes in, she decides to have an abortion. What is the process then um, once that woman decides that she's going to have an abortion? What is the discussion that takes place about um, donating of you know the baby and the tissue? What I, I apologize. That, I, I apologize. That I, I mean, I think that you can uh, uh, talk to the uh, McGee Women's Health uh, Group. I mean, I, I was called to testify about the use of fetal tissue, the research, the actual research parts. Apologize. Uh, I can say that I do consent patients with brain cancer for tissue utilization, and I'm. Uh, likely similar in my approach that we make sure that, you know, there's an informed consent, which I, uh, Dr. Greeley, who's uh, speaking next, is a world expert on. Okay. I just wanted to, you know, as a, you know, legislator, understanding what that process is of, you know, what information yeah, is I think, I, you know, if, beforehand. If you'd like to submit a question, I'm sure that we could find an individual within the UPMC system to answer those questions. And I'd be that, happy. That, to do that. that would be great, and and maybe you can't, you know, answer the, this follow up. You know, once so once that um, patient consents to the donation of the tissue, and what happens then? So the the abortion happens, and then where does the tissue go from there? I, I apologize. This is not okay. an area of expertise. So. Okay. Um, thank you, Deb. Just trying to, to kind of walk through the, the no, process No, I, I, totally, I totally understand. It's an appropriate question, and uh, I'm sorry that I can't okay. answer. Um, so, so then, you know, once these tissues are, har are harvested, we, we have the tissue, then the cells are extracted, then that's when that's essentially where you come into play? Your, well, again, I mean, my, my colleagues would come into play. So, so, I, so, again, one of the things, and then I, I realize, I mean, one of the challenges is these are very complex issues. And, you know, uh, the last uh, individual mentioned, for example, you know, having practiced in the 1970s and 80s. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you from my own experience, um, the, the degree of change that has occurred in our understanding in science is dramatic and has, you know, occurs within the matter of months. And so, uh, frankly, you know, one of the things that's happened is that there's been an evolving change in both of our understanding of what the, the tissues are. So, again, it, it's like if I handed you a bunch of bricks, those are the cells that make up a house. But if I handed you a bunch of bricks, you're not going to understand how to build a house. And so one of the things that the tissue is used for is that three-dimensional incredible complexity that occurs. And I myself, as I mentioned previously, uh, am an expert in building organoids. And those are trying to get towards those more complex systems, but we still remain quite far off from that. So again, I, I, I can't speak to you about the exact handoff of tissues, but I can speak to you about uh, how the, the tissues are ultimately uh, incredibly valuable because they're complex. Okay, so so I guess one one last question. Um, yeah. I guess you 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 made mention of a cell purification procedure. I don't believe I made a, a, a any reference to cell purification. So, okay, um, so so I guess my question is then: so when the cells come to you, what exactly do you do? next with them okay i i get i guess i apologize that i'm not being clear so i don't directly receive uh tissues or cells from fetuses myself so i uh there are a number of fetal derived cells um you probably have heard that most of what has been done for example with the COVID 19 vaccines has been at some point in time used with different cell types, for example, 293 cells that are human embryonic kidney cells. Um, but I myself do not receive from any fetal 
uh, tissues directly from abortion. So I'm afraid I can't tell you what specific individuals do. I can just tell you my personal experience. Well, doctor, uh, thank you for what you have been able to answer. Um, I, I, I know I would, and I'm sure the committee members would love, um, you know, follow up with an individual, maybe one of the researchers at Pitt sure. who were involved with some of these studies, you know, to be able to walk us through you know, their process. Yeah, so I, think that I, would, I would just be helpful. I apologize for the interrupting. So what I would just say is, uh, just to clarify, so the individuals who would be involved in actual uh, consenting for the procedure, as well as the subsequent step through, are, there's gonna be three or four different hands uh, involved in that. So it's not as if that the researchers themselves have anything at all, they have no contact whatsoever with uh, the, the, the woman involved or directly in terms of processing the, the initial tissue. So it's not a single individual, it's a whole series of individuals who have been involved. Okay, Th thank you so much for that. And you know, we look forward to continued conversations with you know, some of these researchers to, to truly better understand how this whole process unfolds. But thank you so much for what you have been able to offer. My pleasure. Thank you, Representative uh, Representative Alec. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the opportunity. I'm real briefly, I have to run off to uh, another hearing where we're talking about uh, how the effects of drugs affect babies in the womb next. So, um, kind of uh, interesting how these connect. Um, when did you start at Pitt? Did you say was it January? Uh, the beginning of this year. So, I I find it interesting that Pitt, you know, decided to send somebody that's been there for a few months when we're asking well, questions I, about I, I, projects yes. that have been going on since 2013 but yeah I, so so just to just to address things thank you for that question so uh, i would just say to you that i do have ample experience in the stem cell biology field i'm a recognized expert um you know i i i would note that um Again, uh, I'm one of the world's experts in my field. I have had the pleasure of serving as the co-director for the National Center for Regenerative Medicine. Uh, and I was also the chair of one of the only stem cell biology departments in the United States. Well, I'm not questioning your qualifications in any way, shape, or form. I'm just saying we, we have specific questions of, around a lot of the research that, that's been going on for years for, at the university that you're working for. Um, so you did say cell purification at one point in your testimony, um, and we can okay, go back. Okay, well, I, I might have mentioned that the cell purification, so that's not not with regard to my own research, but there was purification that was done in Italy uh, or, or in conjunction with the Italian studies, but um, those were, it was purification from liver tissue, so. Okay. The UPMC. Uh, I don't work on the liver, so. Okay. I just wanted to make that clear. A representative called okay. me asked about that, and you definitely did I, mention I it. I appreciate that. I wrote it yeah. down, <laughs> so because I wanted, to, I was curious <laughs> well, I what that it. meant. I'd never I, heard I, it, so it, it is possible doctors make mistakes. I'm just kidding. But yeah, you know. no. Um, so, is there a contract with UPMC um, for the the tissues that you receive? Uh, again, I, I apologize. I'm going to have to correct you again. I do not directly receive tissues from fetal sorry, abortions. Sorry, sorry uh, Pitt, the, the Pitt receives. Uh, you know, you'd have to ask an administrator from, from them. Uh, again, if you'd like to submit questions, I'd be uh, pleased to help in making sure that the information is transmitted. I, I'm here to discuss research, not, not the procedures. So. Okay. Um, that's all I have, um, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Representative Frankel. Thank you, Madam Chair, and th thank you, Dr. Rich. Uh, I know this is a, a, a difficult uh, hearing uh, and, uh, and an unfortunate focus uh, of, uh, of where we're headed with this. Um, to be clear, you know, the University of Pittsburgh has a long history of uh, excellence in uh, biomedical research, uh, having cured polio, uh, transplantation, and the research that you're engaged in. And we're grateful, uh, and it's transformed uh, our community and our city and our state uh, in terms of uh, you know, the resources that uh, we've been successful in being able to access from the federal government uh, and others uh, to, to do this research, this life-affirming research. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, and I wish we were focused on those sorts of things uh, as a health committee, uh, because this is life-affirming work that you're doing. 
Um, and also to my colleagues, uh, to be clear, uh, since there are questions here about consent, um, uh, we did speak to a patient to which we, we would have liked to have had testify uh, and who was willing to testify who talked about how affirming her experience has, was and how grateful she was for the opportunity to make a donation. And that is clearly what takes place here. Th these are uh, informed consent donations uh, uh, by uh, women uh, and, uh, and, and they are critical to uh, helping cure uh, diseases that uh, have long plagued uh, our uh, constituents. Um, so let me ask you just one question, Dr. Rich. Um, you know, can you maybe talk about, I don't know if th you can do this, but uh, what life-saving treatment would we not have without consensually donated tissue? Uh, what might we lose in the future if we didn't have uh, the ability to utilize uh, this tissue? Well, thank you. I, well, you, you mentioned polio, and polio is obviously one of those. I mean, so w one of the things to keep in mind is we do like to talk cure, but we also need to talk improvements in terms of both uh, length of life and quality of life. So uh, I'll give you an example. I'm trained as a neurologist, and um, the sad reality is that most neurologic diseases simply do not have the ability to be even improved. So if we think about patients, for example, with uh, stroke or spinal cord uh, injuries, that we simply do not have any um, research right now that doesn't involve more advanced tissues that really has shown any sort of promise. And so um, the fact is that if we're going to get people with spinal cord injuries to walk again, we know that just putting cells in the spinal cord, which we've tried many times, will not be sufficient. We need more advanced tissues. We do uh, also know that infectious diseases and cancer uh, have already, so HIV, for example, uh, some of the treatments from HIV have been uh, pioneered through the use of what are called humanized mice. Unfortunately, mice have a very different immune system, completely different kind of immune system than, than humans do. So we can cure, I can cure lots of brain cancers in mice. But what we realize is that these kinds of models fail to replicate in human patients. So um, the list is nearly limitless where we really need to have more advanced understanding of the immune system uh, and also more complex. Thank you, Dr. Rich. Thank you, Representative. And uh, certainly, uh, under the Abortion Control Act, it does allow for fetal experimentation as long as there is a consent form after uh, the woman has made her decision regarding the abortion. We're not disputing the fact that the, it is allowed under the Abortion Control Act. Uh, I think what we're trying to look at today is the uh, uh, pretty disturbing uh, and even though, doctor, you say you're not involved, I believe you are the deputy director for research at Pitt. Uh, I, 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 they haven't given me that much authority that I oversee all research. Uh, it's, it's just the cancer center, the Hillman Cancer Center. Thank you. Uh, D uh, Representative Schemmel. Thank you, and uh, thank you, doctor, for testifying today. Um, do you work for the University of Pittsburgh or for UPMC? Uh, I am a physician, and therefore I, I actually have a dual role, but uh, I'm here today as the representative for University of Pittsburgh. And do the two entities, I understand the two entities are organizationally differentiated, but do they share facilities, the research facilities are they shared between the two? Uh, the answer is yes, that's a complex question. Um, there are research facilities that have both UPMC and Pitt researchers in them. Okay, thanks. Um, you explained in your testimony, you said scientists would be overjoyed to obtain stem cells, uh, such as the ones you use, through other methods. Do you mean that uh, the scientists would be overjoyed to be able to obtain stem, uh, stem cells through methods other than through abortion? Is that what you meant well, by that? Well, so, so I, not just stem cells, but complex tissues. If there were a way, and so far there isn't, to replicate the complexity, the beauty of the human tissues that uh, occur, we simply have no ability to replicate that using 
uh, for example, induced pluripotent stem cells. So Shinya Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize with that. But those cells are just, again, as I tried to mention previously, you know, if I handed you uh, uh, some bricks and asked you to build a house, um, you wouldn't know exactly how to build a full house from that. And unfortunately, that's the reality of what we face. Okay. So, so let's say that there, the technology does arise. I mean, why, why would scientists be... Uh, why would scientists be uh, consider it preferable to utilize uh, stem cells from uh, some some method other than through aborted uh, well, uh, fetuses? Well, so so actually, one of one of the main issues is it would uh, give the fact that we would have an understanding of how to reproduce these complex tissues, and and the fact is that you know we are. Um, definitely improving in our understanding, but we are very far off from understanding how this complex dance of development occurs. And so, you know, that that's one issue. I mean, obviously, we'd like to um, make as reproducible a system as possible as well. And so if we had a system that we could say, uh, here, here's the recipe, here we can build uh, whatever we're, look, we're looking for, that would be very valuable. So it's the knowledge itself of how those stem cells would would be rep replicable. It, maybe that's not a scientific term. That's okay. Uh, yeah. Not so I much. I understand what you're trying to say. So that, yeah. that that's one component of it. So yeah. Okay. Would a component of it as well be that scientists are troubled by abortion, or they're troubled by the trouble that abortion brings with it? Uh, I would say that the, the passion on um, both sides of the issue, you know, what we're focused, trying to focus on is, you know, uh, scientists by their very nature are cautious individuals. We go through a lengthy training process. Every time we publish a paper, it goes through a lengthy peer-reviewed process. If we get a grant, it goes through a complex peer-reviewed process. And, you know, certainly people don't embrace uh, you know, the, the, the challenges when it comes to uh, emotional issues. But certainly I think that, you know, everybody would like it so that we could focus on the science um, and really make a difference in a positive, constructive way to uh, make human life, uh, you know, to allow us to have all people, uh, you know, uh, not have diseases and not suffer negative consequences. Um, also, you know, thinking about things like development, you know, the number of babies who are born uh, severely compromised is, is still remains far too high in the United States. We have very poor uh, prenatal care in the United States in general. Um, and, you know, that's, that's one of the things that we as scientists would like to help out to make sure that the babies are born as healthy as possible. Okay, thank you. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Um, I have a couple questions. You made the uh, distinction between the fetal tissue and uh, fetal stem cells. Um, can you please explain the difference in the ways fetal stem cells can be obtained? How are fetal sure. cells? Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'd be pleased. So um, there are a number of different... So uh, I'm going to take a step back, and, and there's not just fetal stem cells, but they're fetal cells in general. So um, I'd like to, um, you know, stem cells, uh, there are different kinds of stem cells, and there's often a confusion that occurs. So, for example, an embryonic stem cell has the capability of becoming any cell in the body. Uh, there are what are called tissue-specific stem cells. So, again, like what I work on, neural stem cells can become any cell type within the nervous system or the brain, the spinal cord. Um, and then we also have um, more differentiated cells. So when we talk about fetal cells, that includes both the fetal stem cells as well as what we call the differentiated progeny. So one of the complexities is that we're still learning how to take a specific cell type, even a, a stem cell, and make it do what we want it to do. So when we're talking about cell-based therapies, so for example, a, a bone marrow transplant is a stem cell transplant. What ends up happening is you put a cell in the body, or cells plural, and it's those stem cells that repopulate. 
So the nice thing about hematopoietic stem cells is they know what to do without very much education. Unfortunately, most solid tissues, that's not the case. So we see that um, a lot of, uh, again, I mentioned uh, 293 cells. These are cells that you can buy from the American Type Culture uh, Consortium, so that's ATCC. Uh, we know that um, there are other cell types that are also available. For example, there are commercial vendors for neural uh, stem cells that are derived either from embryonic stem cells or fetus. So those are the kinds of t uh, cells that I personally um, have used in my research. Uh, thank you, Dr. White. Uh, what's, uh, what would be uh, the difference between using the fetal cells versus the adult stem cells? Uh, sadly, uh, for all of us on this call who are adults, um, we are what's called senescing. Um, so. Uh, our ability to maintain the long-term uh, growth is very limited. And so in each of us, if I took your stem cells, for example, from your brain, uh, and tried to grow them over the long-term, they simply don't do it. And we, we have understood a lot about aging and about what occurs with aging. Um, we have not been able to reverse the aging process um, we really have a great need in, in terms of understanding how aging works. But adult stem cells uh, simply have very limited utility in some aspects. For example, uh, in heart or brain research, adult stem cells are worthless. Thank you. Uh, um, doctor, uh, a lot of us read about the experiment with the, uh, I'm not sure, I believe it was, um, I, well, I'm not going to say even a nationality of the uh, scientists, but there was a, a recent article regarding the combining of uh, human uh, cells with uh, uh, monkey or primate cells. Uh, is there a point in your research where, or the University of Pitt, that would draw a line and say this is something that we ethically would not do as far as research or experimentation using any type of cells? Uh, I, I, I'm afraid you've asked a question that extends beyond my, my role, so uh, I do not make policy for the university. Uh, my own research, again, is focused on brain cancer and brain tumors, so the, the studies that you mentioned. I will say there are, for example, studies that, again, not ones that I've been involved with, but you probably have heard about the poliovirus studies for the treatment of glioblastoma, um, and those required the utilization of, of monkeys. Um, those are, are difficult studies as well, but um, I uh, personally can't tell you that um, I've been involved in any of the kinds of research that you mentioned. How many of your um, research, I'm going to use the word experiments, I don't want to offend you for using that word. No, no, that's okay. Uh, would you, how many of uh, them would you deem to be successful in, in the way that they have actually uh, I'm talking about your, and, and recently, let's just say within the last um, 15 years using, using fetal uh, um, cells, uh, uh -huh. what has been created as far as treatments and cures in the last 15 years? From my personal research? From any search, research that you've read about in the last 15 years. Uh, well, uh, that's a very long list about what I read. You know, for example, I mean, hepatitis C has been cured, cured uh, with drugs. I mean, I have to tell you, um, hepatitis C wasn't even something we understood when I went through medical school. And yeah, uh, excuse me, doctor. I said using fetal uh, fetal cells. Well, actually, some of those cells that were used uh, for some of the testing. So almost every single drug or treatment at some point uses, for example, 293 cells or other common cells that were developed from fetal cells. So the number of 
um, drugs, treatments, genetic tests uh, that have at some point been touched by uh, fetal cells is nearly the entirety of medicine. Representative Bonner. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Rich, uh, for appearing here today. Um, My pleasure. Thank you. Dr. Rich, uh, do you know what fetal research UPMC was doing in Italy that could not be done in Pennsylvania? Uh, I, I can only report to you the information that I, I've given to you. Uh, <clears throat> again, UPMC was not doing research in Italy. They had collaborators. So again, one of the things that's very different than in politics than in science is that uh, science is global. And so um, I have collaborators around the world at this very moment because we all share the same values and that is to eliminate human disease. Um, and therefore very often what will happen is we can collaborate with people around the world because we, we share those values. Um, so I do not believe UPMC was directly involved in any way, shape or form in terms of performing. And again, I'm speaking from the University of Pittsburgh, so I'm not here as a UPMC individual, but th it was not UPMC individuals uh, doing some sort of research in the seeds. It was collaborators over there. Those were not UPMC paid physicians then in Italy? The, the research itself, uh, they, they were not UPMC uh, individuals, I believe. So again, this is, um, I, I, I am not the individual overseeing those indi you know, individuals involved, but I believe that they were uh, individuals in Italy who I can read to you, but they, it, it was purely Italian funding for those individuals, I believe. Was it being done at a UPMC medical facility? Uh, again, you're, you're uh, I apologize. I, I am, uh, I was not involved in that directly. I wouldn't want to mislead you. If you'd like to submit that question, I'd be happy to make sure somebody who's familiar with those exact questions can answer them. Do you know if the research uh, has concluded? Uh, as I mentioned to you, I've been assured that the research concluded in, in 2013. But again, this is uh, information I received from other individuals. Charlie, um, do you know why it was concluded in 2013? Uh, you have been the recipient of as much information as I, I, I'm aware, I'm afraid. All right. Thank you, doctor. My pleasure. You know, I just would like to say that, you know, projects end uh, all the time. So it's, uh, we, we pursue new lines of inquiry all the time, so. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I believe our last question will come from Representative Kiefer. Thank you, Dr. Rich. I'm just trying to, I'm gonna pay you back on uh, Representative Bonner just to get a better understanding. Um, as you're aware, there was a lot of uh, discussion regarding the Sicily experiments. And so you, I thought you explained it well, where you said it was a team approach, that's how you guys go at it. And so the part of, of those experience, or experiments that that University of Pitt was involved with was the cell purification on liver tissue, is that correct? I believe that that is what I've been, been told, yes. Do you know where, those liver, uh, was that liver tissue, was was that fetal liver tissue? Uh, you know, the exact specifics, again, I, I would uh, encourage you if you'd like to submit a question, I'd be happy to, to pass it on to the individuals involved directly. Okay, and do you know, so in that team approach, do you know if everybody, uh, whether they were University of Pitt um, employees or, or scientists were aware of what everybody was doing on this team approach, on this, ex all, all of the experiments that were going on? Uh, I, again, I, this is a set of individuals that, I, that does not include me, so um, it, it would purely be speculation on my part. Okay, so I didn't know, you know, what would be documented since it concluded in 2013, if, you know, you had what that team approach was and what that report may have, have been. Uh, yeah, again, uh, it's, I'm happy if you'd like to submit a question to, to have, submit it to those individuals directly involved. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. 
Thank you, Representative. Um, and Doctor, I, I do have one last question. You say you work with a team approach. Do you, are you, um, uh, do you, are, and are you familiar what all those teams research projects are? And are there other research uh, hospitals across the state of Pennsylvania that you work with doing the same type of research? Uh, forgive me for, so are you, are you asking whether I know what every single person I ever collaborated with does? No, your, your project research teams at the university. Uh -huh. Do you, do you keep tabs uh, on w what projects they are researching and the progress of those research projects? And do you collaborate with other research hospitals across the state of Pennsylvania? So me personally, I, I can only speak to my own situation. Uh, so, you know, I keep track of what's going on in, in my team and in my with my collaborators I, I personally don't have uh collaborators within the state of pennsylvania as of yet uh i mostly have worked with individuals outside of the state in terms of my role um you know we work in the cancer center uh you know it isn't likely that i could name you every single person's activities within the hundreds of people who work in a cancer center on a daily basis. But overall, we, we do try and make sure that we have a good understanding of collectively the effort. Again, within the cancer centers, which is uh, where I'm housed, um, I would say that the, the number of exciting work, you know, experiments that are being done uh, are very complex. I doubt any single person uh, much like I, you probably don't know what every single person in the Pennsylvania government is doing. Uh, I doubt that any single person knows everything in the Pittsburgh system. So, I was just kind of inquiring if you had any um, uh, timely reports or anything like that. But I want to thank you, Doctor, for being here. We we are out of time for your testimony. Tru okay, truly, truly appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. And if members do have further questions, we will make sure that they are submitted to you uh, for a response. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Our next testifier today, and I believe uh, Dr. or Professor uh, Henry Greeley is with us. He is at Stanford University, Professor of Law and the Director Center for Law and Biosciences. Director of the Stanford Program in Neuroscience and, and Society Chair, Steering Committee of the Center for Biomedical Ethics. Um, Professor Greeley, are you with us, sir? I am. At least I hope so. Okay. I don't see you on video. I don't know if my, you... You know, my camera is turned on. I don't see me on video either. <laughs> Given my pandemic haircut, that might be a good thing, but... Okay. As far as I can tell from my side, my camera should be on. Um, this okay. is a format that I'm not uh, I'm more, more accustomed to Zoom than to this Microsoft format, so that might okay. be a problem. All right. Uh, well, Professor, if you could please, under House rules, uh, raise your right hand to be sworn in. And even though we can't see you, we'd still like you to Hi. raise your right hand. I and, I'm doing that. And do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is true to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? And if so, please indicate by saying, I do. I do. Thank you. And you may proceed with your testimony. Well, good morning. And here in California, it is finally beginning to be morning. Um, I hope I'm cogent. I've had a couple of cups of coffee, but it's a little early in the day for me. Uh, I have been a professor of law at Stanford since 1985. My research focuses on ethical, legal, and social implications of advances in the biosciences. Uh, I work mainly on issues arising from genetics, neuroscience, human stem cell research, uh, assisted reproduction, uh, human subjects uh, research ethics, and a wide variety of different issues. Kind of interestingly to me, the very first paper I ever published in the bioethics field was about the question on the that's called uh, that that has brought this hearing into being, 
Uh, it was in 1989 in the New England Journal of Medicine. I was the lead author of a committee paper on the ethical use of human fetal tissue in medicine. So it's um, interesting to me that 32 years later, um, we're still talking about some of the same things. Uh, what I thought I'd do is highlight some of the ethical issues. Uh, I can't um, speak to the, ah, wait, there I am. Ah, good, you can see my cardinal, Stanford Cardinal red sweater vest. Can you see me now? Yes, we can. Okay, good. And you can see my pandemic haircut as well, uh, or lack thereof. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is highlight some of the, the ethical issues. These are not definitive ethical answers. There are not, for most interesting questions, definitive ethical answers. But I think this is a, one approach to asking, to, to try to focus on some of the questions that are most relevant ethically about human fetal tissue, about research with human fetal tissue. So first, it is always important to look at the potential benefits of the research, not just to say, oh, look at all the wonderful things this can do, but to ask, is this research actually likely to lead to anything good? Research that can't lead to any useful findings is almost by its nature unethical research. It's using human cells, it's using human subjects, it's using non-human animals. At the very least, it's using people's time and money. Uh, and if it's doing it without any reasonable chance of, of advancing human knowledge or doing other good things, it's unethical. Uh, we don't often think about that as an ethical issue, but it is. Uh, I think, as Dr. Rich pointed out, uh, it is clear that at least as a broad category, research using human fetal tissues and tissues derived and cells and other tissues derived from human fetal tissues has as a general matter, produced uh, treatments and knowledge that have reduced human suffering, which is morally a good thing. Uh, that certainly doesn't mean that all such research does that. And the research needs to be examined both at the high general level, does this generally do anything useful, as well as each individual research project needs to be interrogated, probably not by state legislatures, but by officials in institutional review boards, the ethics committees, at the NIH, at ind individual medical centers, and so on, asking, is this research that can lead to something useful or not? Um, if the answer to that is yes, then there's a question of the use of fetal tissue or cells derived from fetal tissue. And there, I think it's really important to, to look at how that tissue by law, has to be obtained and the limitations on obtaining it. In 1993, Congress passed the NIH Revitalization Act. Uh, this act reversed the policies of the first president of President Reagan and the first President Bush against using federal funds, but it limited the ways federal funds could be used for research using tissues or cells from aborted fetuses. It says that human fetal tissue may be used only if the woman who is providing the tissue, the woman who is having an abortion, makes a statement in writing and signed by her, declaring that she donates the fetal tissue for use in research, but the donation was made without any restriction regarding who would be recipients of any transplant of the tissue, and that she hasn't been informed of the identity of any such individuals. It can be used only if the attending physician, with respect to obtaining the tissue, makes a statement in writing and signed by the doctor, declaring that in the case of the tissue obtained pursuant to an induced abortion, the consent of the woman for the abortion was obtained prior to requesting or obtaining consent for a donation of the tissue for use in such research. No alteration in the timing method or procedures used to terminate the pregnancy was made solely for the purposes of obtaining the tissue and the t abortion was performed in, accord in accordance with applicable state law. That same federal statute makes it a crime to violate those, uh, those conditions and a crime to buy or sell for valuable consideration of human fetal tissue. So 
that's the federal framework. It's a framework that affects what research can be done with NIH funding. That kind of position is certainly applies as a matter of federal law to all NIH funds and the vast majority of research in American medical institutions, including I'm sure UPMC, is done with NIH funds. But the same policy is often adopted by universities for research that's done with non-federal funds. So the idea behind those restrictions was to do as good a job as possible of saying no abortions take place because the woman wants to participate in research. She has to have made the decision before she's even asked about research. She can't say, yes, I'm going to have the abortion and that tissue should be used to help my sister, my mother, my husband. It's trying to separate the decision to have the abortion as much as humanly possible from any incentives about donating tissue for research. Can it be 100% effective? No. No, no, nothing we humans do can ever be 100% effective. Now, murder's been illegal for a long time. It still happens from time to time. It may be the case that there is some woman on the fence about abortion, about having an abortion, who says, well, you know, I've heard that there's useful research that can be done. I guess that's the feather that's going to push me over in one direction or in the other. Uh, but it does, I think, as good a job as one can do in trying to separate the motive for the abortion from the use of fetal tissue and hence to try to separate the fetal tissue from, uh, to make it, to, to make it as, as certain as possible, which is not entirely certain, that the fetal tissue research will not have led to more abortions, to abortions that wouldn't otherwise have happened. So if the research has good potential outcomes, and if it doesn't lead to an increase in abortions, what should we think about it? There are going to be different ways of approaching that, or else this hearing wouldn't be held, and, and we wouldn't still be discussing this 32 years after I wrote an article about it. Um, if abortion is not viewed as a bad thing, then the argument's pretty straightforward. Even if one believes that abortion is a bad thing, and it's a very bad thing, the argument against the use of this tissue becomes somewhat difficult and limited. It's kind of like an issue with organ transplantation. And let's say, and I, I'm not, uh, I want to be clear, I don't believe that abortion is murder, but I'm going to use this analogy anyway. If somebody is murdered, should we not use with appropriate consent for the next of kin or advanced consent for the deceased, should we not use their tissues for their organs for organ transplantation? kidneys, heart, liver, lungs, to save other lives. The murder was bad. The use of the organs to save lives is good. We don't think, you know, one can imagine a situation where somebody was murdered in order to get the organs, and there have been allegations that things like that have happened in other countries. Uh, not No such allegations here, and it would, of course, be illegal. But if the good can come from this act, even if the act itself was bad, is there an ethical problem with it? Many people, including me, would say no, but not everyone would. There are people who believe that um, the use of this tissue entails a complicity, a sharing of guilt in the deeply, un deeply wrong act of abortion, such that it should not be used. Should, because by using it, you are, you are becoming complicit in, you are accepting, you are to some extent endorsing this original evil act of abortion. That is an internally consistent ethical position. It is one that some people, including some people I know and respect, uh, hold. Um, it is not, I think, a majority position because in fact, there are lots of things we do and use that are the result, at least in part, of terrible actions that have happened in the past. And when we enjoy the rights we have under the 14th Amendment, uh, we are enjoying something that came about because of the Civil War, which killed hundreds of thousands of Americans, particularly people from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, 
this most important battle was fought in your commonwealth, or at least one of the most important battles, uh, and that in turn was caused by the horrors of slavery. Those were terrible things. They led to the 14th Amendment. That doesn't make the 14th Amendment, for most people, a terrible thing. I submit that a similar analysis is for many people, though not for all, convincing with respect to the use of fetal tissue in abortion. So there are disagreements on whether this is ethical or appropriate or not. What do we do with disagreements? Well, we turn to the political process. We turn to you. This is, at least for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, your job to sort out these political disagreements, bearing in mind the wishes indirectly expressed of your constituents, as well as what you think is good policy and bad policy, and the constraints of your own conscience. Because legislators, I think, need to be allowed to have to exercise their own consciences as well. I think the argument for fetal tissue use, if that tissue is obtained in a way that discourages as far as possible any additional abortions, is a strong one. Um, but I don't expect everyone to be convinced by it. The political process is what it is. We need to let it work, work its way out. I can say that if Pennsylvania, I, I hope Pennsylvania continues to support research with these tissues and cells, important research, and the Pennsylvania institutions, including Pitt, which is a great university with a really uh, medical school that's been very important in advances in biomedical science, continues to be able to do this. If the Commonwealth decides that it shouldn't, that's the Commonwealth's right. Uh, I will note that I think a number of California universities would probably be happy to welcome Pitt faculty who want to continue doing their important research. I think that's what I want to say as an opening statement. I'm happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I thank you for being honest and direct. And our Abortion Control Act in the state of Pennsylvania does cover many of uh, issues of what you stated. We certainly have the consent forms in, uh, in our Abortion Control Act. And uh, uh, our Abortion Control Act has withstood a uh, challenge in the US Supreme Court. But uh, I guess the, the issue, you know, before us regarding some of the experiments that we see does go to uh, ethics. And uh, as a professor and someone who studied law in, in this area in uh, biosciences, is there a point in, is there an ethical line that you believe should not be crossed? as far as uh, fetal experimentation, or is, is there a line? Uh, and the, the, the doctor from Pitt, I asked about the, the article that was recently published regarding the um, cells of the, the monkey and the human embryos. Is, does that go beyond what you think would be ethical? Or in, in your in your field, uh, and we certainly saw you know experiences experiments in the past on people that uh, other other uh, people in the world saw saw as very unethical. So is there a point where we say uh, this is not ethical? That society yeah. should not be saying this? Yes, of course there is. Um, we've seen it in the past, it continues in the present. There is research that is illegal in the United States as well as in various states. In 1948 in Nuremberg, 12 physicians, German physicians, were hanged by the neck until dead for doing research that, in, that were crimes against humanity, such as intentionally freezing to death Polish prisoners of war in icy water to see how long they could survive and hence see how long they had to pick up German pilots who were downed in the North Sea. Um, the Tuskegee study, where men, hundreds of men, were kept untreated for syphilis, even when penicillin had been developed and was available as an easy cure and treatment for syphilis. They continued to be untreated for syphilis on purpose for 25 years. That's unethical. There are things that are unethical. I'm glad you mentioned the monkey chimera, the, the 
human monkey chimera story because I actually, along with my colleague from Duke, Nita Farahani, published a sh very short uh, commentary in the same issue of the journal Cell in which that article came out. Uh, as we say in that short commentary, that particular research seemed to us at least not to be unethical because those embryos were never transferred into a monkey uterus for possible implantation, gestation, pregnancy, or birth. They couldn't become animals. They couldn't survive more than 19 days. I think 20 days was the longest any of them survived outside the womb. Uh, given that uh, they, it was research only on embryos that would never become organisms. But as we note in that paper, there are people who will disagree with that, who think any kind of mixing of human and non-human cells is a bad idea. Um, difficult to tell that to people, for example, who've got heart valves from pigs that are keeping them alive in their hearts. But, you know, there, there are strong views about that. We also said in that short commentary that if, they, if these embryos were to be transferred into a uterus for possible implantation and possible birth as an organism, then there would be serious ethical issues, and we called in our paper for those ethical issues to begin to be explored. I don't know what my answer is yet as to whether that would cross, whether that research would cross the line. I need to think about it some more. But yes, clearly there is research that crosses ethical lines. There's research that is also clearly ethical. One of the things that makes life difficult but also interesting is the lines often are fuzzy areas and not necessarily nice, sharp, straight lines. Understood. Thank you, Professor. Representative Schimmel. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Professor. Um, Professor, at the beginning of your testimony, you said that uh, you know, in evaluating the uh, ethical component to um, research, you should always look for the potential benefits. And I certainly agree. If there's no no conceivable benefit, then it would seem to there would seem to be multiple reasons why the the, um, the research would be inappropriate. But uh, in weighing the benefits. Are you, are you sort of talking about just sort of classic consequentialism? I mean, where do you, where do you ascertain the benefits outweigh what you think to be the downsides or, in this case, the p potential ethical qualms or problems of some? Right. So this is part of why there is no universal agreement on ethics and hasn't been in the last 3,000 years in which we've been discussing it. My own perspective is largely but not entirely consequentialist. So I, I do look at the consequences as important, although I don't view them as necessarily determinative. If I could save five lives by right now in the most horrific and painful way killing you, a consequentialist might say, go ahead and do it. Um, I wouldn't, uh, with all due respect, uh, kill you uh, for that. So mine is a modified uh, limited form of consequentialism. How one weighs benefits is always tricky. Um, I was fortunate enough to clerk for Justice Potter Stewart on the Supreme Court, whose, most, whose favorite colleague was Justice Powell, but Justice Stewart would from time to time express frustration. Justice Powell liked seven-part balancing tests, so he gave you the seven factors, but he never really told you how much they weighed and how to balance them. Um, I'm afraid that in a lot of ethical issues, uh, and a lot of issues, ethical and otherwise, we're in that kind of situation, and we do what we as moral actors do. We do the best we can. In in your um, description, in your explanation, you gave an example of you know harvesting organs uh, or other tissue for research from the victim of a murder. However, it strikes mm -hmm. me that the the situation that we are examining uh, is different. Uh, this is a very systematized process whereby, you know, abortions occur, uh, the, the, uh, the tissue is harvested in a very, you know, mechanized manner so that it is maximized for the use in the research, um, and then it is handed over uh, to the researchers to do the research. So this is, this is a very contrived cycle of how this is done, unlike a murder where, you know, you have the unfortunate victim and the one good that can come. Uh, is different. Do you do you see a differentiation between those? Does it does it do you believe raise any additional 
ethical qualms that there's actually a system. And this goes into what you acknowledge to be some of your colleagues who would say complacency in evil, or I would say participation in evil. Uh, do you believe that that's a factor? And if so, how? So first, it, you may not be surprised to hear that I, I do agree with you that the situations are not the same. But for me, that's because I don't believe that abortion is an evil on along the lines of murder. Um, the issue of the process, the, the regularization and almost bureaucratization of the process of obtaining tissue, I think you will find, in fact, is not that different when it comes to issues of organ transplantation. What gets somebody in the hospital declared dead and available as an organ transplant is the murder, which is, which is not planned, uh, just as the abortion was not planned by the researchers. But once that person is declared brain dead in the hospital, a very complicated system and very heavily regulated and bureaucratized system swings into, into force to try to get organs that will be useful to save lives. So I'm, I'm not sure that there's the difference it, that, in fact, it's as different as um, you think it is. I, actually, I, I agree that I think uh, that, um, harvesting of organs for, uh, for transplants also raises ethical questions, so, so I, I would agree in that. Uh, you know, one final question then. So you would certainly, I'm, sh I'm sure, acknowledge uh, that, uh, that there are many Americans who believe that abortion is uh, the, uh, the, you know, the ending of, a, of an innocent human life, even if you don't <laughs> share that. As yes. an ethicist, how do you believe that that should factor into the determination of how to expend public monies when you have, you know, a significant portion of the population who does believe that that actually this is a morally evil act that is uh, that is uh, that is murder in their minds? So yes, I do acknowledge that many people, including some of my friends and relatives, um, believe that abortion is a is a completely abhorrent evil action. Um, I think that the best answer I can give is it's a political process question where the political process does its work, which is what you guys are in the, in the middle of doing. Um, I think that that process should take into account how many people hold that view, how strongly they hold it. Um, if it's close to 50-50, then that's one thing. If it's 5% versus 95%, that's a different kind of issue. It, although these numbers, percentages aren't necessarily going to be determinative, uh, more likely it's 15% care strongly one way, 5% care strongly the other way, and 80% don't particularly care strongly one way or the other. Weighing those is difficult. There's no particular science to it. Uh, but I think the um, in the context of Use of tissue that does not, that is set up in a way that does not induce additional abortions. I think the percentage of people who, on reflection, will think that is immoral because caught because involving complicity with abortion is certainly not zero. But I, my own guess, is that it's not going to be very high. But you know Pennsylvania, I don't. Very well, thank you. Thank you, Representative. Perse Professor, we only have two more minutes, and um, uh, I, I definitely want to thank you for being with us today. I'd like to tell the audience that as of today, we've, in this nation since 1973, we've seen 61 million abortions, which when uh, Roe versus Wade pass, passed, it was said that they would be rare, safe, and legal. Um, they are safe, and most of the time, uh, most of the time they are safe, uh, they are legal, but today they are definitely not rare. But I do want to thank you so very much for your time. I know there's a big uh, time change uh, between us and you, uh, so I want to thank you very much. And at this time I want to just say to the audience that we are joined by Representative Cephas, Representative Kajewski, Representative Fiedler, Representative Gatos. So thank you for attending, representatives. Did, did yeah. you have a question and, or comments, no, Representative Frankel? First of all, I, I thought this was uh, a very helpful discussion. And uh, Professor Greeley, uh, you know, uh, we're very indebted to you for, for getting up early this morning on very, very short notice 
uh, to provide this testimony. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think you drew some really, you know, interesting uh, parallels here. I mean, it, there is no hard line here. Uh, part of what we're trying to do here, what my colleagues uh, uh, in the majority party are trying to do here is is to draw that hard line, and I think uh, uh, the ethical issues are complicated. I thank you for um, you know shedding light on it, and uh, really appreciate uh, your participation uh, this morning. Thank you. Well, I, I'd like to thank the committee for giving me the opportunity to participate in the, the democratic, and this is with a little d democratic uh, process. Uh, I think what what you do is important. And uh, the, the more we can think through these issues, uh, my hope is we come out better overall as a result. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk. Thank you, Professor. We do have a question, I think, from Representative Kajewski that we will submit to you. And uh, if you could get back to us um, at, uh, sure. at your, uh, in a sure. timely fashion, we truly appreciate it. Thank sure. you very my much email for being address with us today. For for anyone is H Greeley, G R E E L Y, at stanford.edu, and I promise to try to respond to any emails that get sent to me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. At Bye. this time, our last um, uh, presenter testifier for the day is uh, David Delighton. I believe David is on the screen. Uh, David, welcome. And David is with the Center for Medical Progress. Some of you might uh, be familiar with his name, some of you not. Uh, David, at this time, it is under House rules that you uh, swear that you would tell the truth. So if you would please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is true to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? If so, please indicate by saying, I do. Yes, I do. Thank you, and you may proceed. Madam Chair, Ranking Member Frankel, Distinguished committee members, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you this morning. I'm David Delighton, and I'm the head of the Center for Medical Progress, which is a citizen journalism organization that monitors and reports on bioethical issues that impact human dignity. We're especially concerned about the exploitation of the vulnerable in government-sponsored experiments on human fetuses and human infants and their parents who are vulnerable to abortion. Under my leadership, CMP conducted a multi-year undercover video investigation of the illegal trafficking of aborted fetuses and sale of their body parts. And we began releasing the results of that in 2015. Our reporting shut down two companies that admitted illegally selling body parts from abortions at Planned Parenthood in Southern California. And the local district attorney thanked us for prompting that successful case. It's been 10 years now since the horrific crimes of Dr. Kermit Gosnell were revealed in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where Dr. Gosnell was delivering late-term fetuses alive and killing them by snipping their necks with surgical scissors. Dr. Gosnell sometimes kept the baby's feet as souvenirs. The horrors of the Kermit Gosnell case were able to take place and continue for so long because they were enabled by Commonwealth officials who preferred secrecy to public accountability in Pennsylvania's abortion industry. Sadly, as we've heard through some of the testimony already this morning, it's a matter of public record that there are horrific abuses of aborted infants taking place on the other side of Pennsylvania through the extensive fetal experimentation programs at the taxpayer-funded University of Pittsburgh. There were a lot of obfuscations and misrepresentations from the Pitt testimony earlier today, which I think is something you would expect uh, when they send a new guy who's only been there for five months to talk about research that he's not actually involved in. So I'm going to try to address some of those and correct the record a little bit. Um, and so in a recent study, as we've heard, Pitt scientists describe scalping five-month-old aborted babies and grafting their scalps onto the backs of lab rats to keep them growing. Yes, lab rats, if you actually look at the published paper on the Nature Scientific Reports website, they used both rats and mice in the study. In the study, you can see the pictures of little baby scalps growing tiny baby hairs on the backs of lab rats and lab mice. Each one of those scalps growing baby hair on a rat represents a little Pennsylvania baby who would have grown those little hairs on their head if they had not been killed by abortion for experiments with, with rodents. 
Starting in 2016, Pitt received a $1.4 million grant from the NIH to become the distribution hub for aborted fetal kidneys and bladders and other organs in the NIH's Genitourinary Development Mapping Atlas program. Pitt's grant application for this grant from the NIH states that the university has a unique access to a large number of high quality aborted fetuses and can quote, ramp up delivery of aborted fetal body parts across the country. And two years ago, I published an op-ed exposing the live fetal liver harvesting of Pitt's Dr. Jörg Gerlach, a stem cell scientist in Pitt's McGowan Regenerative Medicine Institute. Dr. Gerlach's protocol calls for aborting five-month-old fetuses alive via labor induction in order to deliver the baby whole, then wash the baby, place the baby on a surgical tray, and cut the baby open to harvest his or her liver as fresh and clean as possible. This is not just for liver cultures, this is for liver transplants. Dr. Gerlach, Dr. Gerlach's team boasts in their published work that this way they can harvest an unprecedentedly massive number of stem cells from the fetal liver for use in experimental transplants into adults. Dr. Gerlach's protocol describes this liver harvesting as a, quote, in vivo procedure, meaning in the living body, and requires the harvesting to take place immediately after the baby's umbilical cord has been cut. Pitt has tried to say that this is over, that it was only going on in Italy, not in the United States. There's serious reasons to doubt the veracity of those statements from the University of Pittsburgh and reasons to be very concerned that it's still going on in the United States. Dr. Gerlach and his team published a study into as recently as 2019 where they described obtaining whole livers in Pittsburgh from Pittsburgh abortion providers, and they described obtaining that same unprecedentedly large number of stem cells, about 2 billion liver cells per individual fetal liver. They described getting the same amount that they were saying in years prior, they were solely able to get because of this special live induction labor um, harvesting procedure that they were publishing on. Experimenting on a living fetus or failing to provide medical care to a born alive infant regardless of prematurity is a third degree felony in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Sadly, live fetal experimentation has been reported and documented at Pitt for decades previously. And this legislative body has even heard testimony previously. Uh, about live fetal experimentation at the University of Pittsburgh. During my undercover work several years ago, I met a group of abortion providers from Planned Parenthood of Western Pennsylvania who were also faculty members at the University of Pittsburgh. The Planned Parenthood abortion providers told me on undercover video that they supply the university's tissue bank from the abortions that they perform. Yet astoundingly, the University of Pittsburgh has issued statements to the media and statements to this legislative body, including renewing it earlier this morning, that, quote, there is no procurement relationship for tissue with Planned Parenthood. It seems clear to me why the university is lying to you. Since 2005, Pitt has been a major site for Planned Parenthood's abortion training programs. Some of the worst violators in Planned Parenthood's abortion and fetal research practices were trained at Pitt. To give you just one example, if you recall the Southern California company that I mentioned, Da Vinci Biosciences, that was shut down because of my investigative reporting, the Planned Parenthood medical director who was supplying Da Vinci, Dr. Jennifer Russo, did her abortion training program at the University of Pittsburgh. Pitt is not just exporting aborted baby body parts across the country, but they are also exporting the worst practices of the abortion industry to other states. Today, Planned Parenthood of Western Pennsylvania's medical director still runs the abortion training program at Pitt, and Planned Parenthood Western Pennsylvania itself is a contracted care site for the University of Pittsburgh, and thus receives access to the university system's provider infrastructure, patient population, and medical students and residents. And in fact, the current medical director of Planned Parenthood Western Pennsylvania, who runs the abortion training program at Pitt, also sits on the institutional review board at Pitt that is in charge of approving uh, fetal experimentation projects at the university as ethical or not. 
So it all looks suspiciously like an illegal quid pro quo for aborted fetal organs and tissues. Pennsylvania's law against selling fetal tissue or organs is actually even more strictly framed than the federal law and prohibits any consideration whatsoever in exchange for fetal tissue. In conclusion, I think it's crucial for public officials in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, including the people's representatives in this legislative body, to exercise all of the oversight authority that is available to you to ensure that the crimes of Kermit Gosnell are not being perpetuated in Pennsylvania by an unaccountable taxpayer-funded abortion industry. Thank you for listening. I'm open to taking your questions now for the remaining time that we have. Thank you, David, uh, for being here. Thank you for bringing up Gosnell, which is uh, uh, the case that I brought up when I uh, decided to have these hearings. It certainly is a black mark on the state of Pennsylvania. Any citizen can download the Gosnell grand jury report from your internet, and um, it really is a horror story. Uh, I asked several questions about crossing the ethical line, and uh, Gosnell didn't just cross the ethical line, he crossed the legal line. Um, so th the report is very gruesome to read, uh, talking about uh, uh, babies born alive and then Dr. Gosnell uh, snipping uh, the backs of their necks to cause their demise. And um, we don't know really how many, how many babies that involved. But we know from the testimony during the trial that it was many, and this happened in Philadelphia in the state of Pennsylvania and not that long ago. Fortunately, uh, this committee, chaired at that time by Representative Matt Baker, was able to introduce the uh, Facilities uh, Act and uh, uh, took a look at correcting actions so that uh, the legislature was hoping that that would never happen again in the state of Pennsylvania. So that is one of the reasons that uh, when we started hearing about what was going on in Pittsburgh and uh, to have the hearings, plus uh, when we run pro-life bills, we've always been told we never have hearings. This was a chance to have the hearings and try to air out as much as possible in committee meetings so that when we get on the floor, uh, legislators can say we, we flushed all this out during our hearings. But I, I uh, do appreciate you being here. And uh, maybe we should acknowledge, David, uh, the, the state of California did not look too kindly in some of your investigative reporting. And so um, uh, there has been some action taken against you. D could you just air that for us, please, so, so we're out in the open about this, sir? Sure. Sure. Uh, thank you. So the um, so undercover reporting is widely practiced and legal in the state of California. Local uh, TV news reporters um, in California, as well as many other states, routinely do undercover video investigations and record it and publish it in the state of California. Um, and uh, and that is normally a, a regular part of California advocacy and journalism. Um, and yet, somehow, over the past couple of years here, um, I and uh, one of my undercover investigator colleagues have become pretty inexplicably the uh, the first and only case of a criminal prosecution of news gathering under the California video recording law to ever be brought in the 60-year history of that law in the state. Um, even though we recorded in, in crowded, uh, open places of public accommodation, just like any local news reporter in California. Um, if you do that kind of undercover journalism in California about animal welfare or factory farming or exposing unlicensed marijuana dealerships, um, unlicensed marijuana dispensaries, uh, that uh, that seems to be permitted and even welcomed by the uh, by the law enforcement in the state. But if you do it to expose the um, the abuse of patients or the abuse the abuse of, uh, of of human fetuses in the state of California, that is uh, that apparently is is a message that is criminal and has to be uh, canceled and suppressed by by the state. So. Um, it's a you know it's a it's a strange case and it's a it's a disturbing case for anyone who really cares about um, just being able to talk openly about issues that matter to the public like we're doing um, at a hearing like this today. 
and uh, uh, the um, the main the main uh, uh, conversations and uh, video recordings that we released um, from California uh, have actually been blessed by the um, by the judge in that case and made specific findings that these are places of public accommodation and recording was entirely appropriate there. Um, so uh, you know, so so uh, so uh, we'll see where that goes in the uh, in the next year or so. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, I think based on the kind of testimony that we've heard in this hearing today and information that will continue to come out, um, I think there are, I, th I think the fact that the University of Pittsburgh, you know, sent a, sent the new guy who's only been there for five months instead of sending the actual scientists or sending the actual medical directors who could really answer a lot of our questions about these topics, it shows that I think some very powerful people are very afraid of the truth and of the facts being reported on the issues of fetal experimentation and fetal trafficking. Um, and that's why you know, the law in places like California is being twisted to silence discussion of these topics. Um, and I think that's why the people who really know don't want to necessarily come out into the light and out into the open in hearings like this to really talk about and put the facts on the record. Because if the facts are really put on the record, um, I think that uh, I, I, I think that that will be uh, that will be a, a monumental reckoning for the country. So that's I, ho I hope that answers your your question. Uh, thank you, David. I just thought we should uh, get that out in the open. So. Um uh, we're not uh, blindsided here by, you know, after the fact. Um, to your knowledge, are there other universities, other research hospitals in Pennsylvania, let's just talk about Pennsylvania, that are doing similar or the same type of research as the University of Pittsburgh Medical Yeah, Center? so certainly so so what we know from the publicly available sources right now um the uh some of the uh the reporting that the nih does do about the fetal experimentation grants that they issue um there's definitely been several large nih grants over the past several years um to researchers at uh both um pennsylvania university uh, or university of pennsylvania at penn um, and also at Temple University and a handful of other locations that I'm not as familiar about. Um, based on the fact pattern that we see with the University of Pittsburgh, um, I right now would be the most concerned about what's going on at Penn uh, because Penn has had uh, uh, sort of the highest volume of fetal experimentation grants from the NIH over the past several years here. Penn also has a um, hosts and abortion training um, program similar to what Pitt does with Planned Parenthood of Western Pennsylvania. Penn has the same kind of relationship with Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. Um, so the fact pattern starts to look a little similar. Um, so if, uh, if there was another location in the state where, um, where investigators were going to start to dig or where um, uh, Commonwealth officials or where the legislature wanted to exercise more oversight authority, I think that would probably be uh, the, the next place. Thank you. Let's see if any of the members have a question for you, David. Representative Frankel, did you have some remarks, sir? Thank you. No, thank you, Madam Chair. A couple of things um, just uh, for the record. Um, fetal experimentation is the process in Pennsylvania of gaining consent, donation consent. Uh, the science is actually uh, research uh, utilizing fetal tissue that has been uh, donated according to ethical standards and legal standards. Uh, with respect to Gosnell, that was a horrific abomination that everybody can agree on, and it was, but it was a rare, uh, Thing. It's not something that typically takes place, and utilizing that as an example uh, uh, that compares in any way uh, with the ethical biomedical research that takes place at our universities is uh, really unacceptable. I would point out also uh, that uh, Mr. Uh, Daladine uh, uh, not only has legal action uh, uh, in California, but he has uh, been found civilly liable for doctoring videos. This all seems very familiar. 21 years ago, another man made a very shocking and disturbing accusation about two companies involved in providing human tissue for scientific research. 
The purported whistleblower claimed that abortion providers trafficked fetuses and altered abortion procedures to obtain tissue specimens. Ultimately, the truth came out. The man admitted under oath that he had lied. It became clear that he had been well paid for it. Congress dropped its inquiry. Newspapers reported that the accusations had been recanted, and Republicans and Democrats both put the disturbing episode behind them. But we now live in a time when lies and distortions simply travel faster than truth. Hearings like this one provide a platform and give a veneer of credibility to fantasies developed in the minds of people who want one thing and one thing alone, to block access to abortion. Every time a judge or jury has looked at this preposterous set of accusations, the answer has been the same. Planned Parenthood is cleared of wrongdoing, and Mr. Daladin and his organization have been revealed as having repeatedly broken the law in an effort to trick us into believing in a taxpayer-funded black market for body parts. In fact, when a grand jury in Texas was given all of the evidence entirely to get to the bottom of accusations against Planned Parenthood, it not only cleared the abortion provider, it indicted Mr. Daladin. 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 Sorry about that. In the six years since Mr. Daladin has been releasing his heavily doctored hoax videos, he has been handed legal defeat after legal defeat. But unlike 21 years ago, when folks could gather around the TV or read the newspaper to hear all the facts, the damage has been done. With social media, the discredited videos move light years faster than the truth, confirming the fears and suspicions of those who have been primed to put their faith in shadowy conspiracies instead of, instead of evidence and facts. But we know better, and we can stay on the side of truth. The accusations discussed today are abhorrent, and fortunately, they are untrue. Tissue donation is carefully regulated, and the process is entirely set up to improve and protect human life. If an organization breaks the rules, there are appropriately consequences in place. And the University of Pittsburgh, which has, base, has been basically attacked today, is one of the nation's top public research universities, seventh in the nation for NIH funding. Pit people beat polio, pioneer TV, and turn my city into the world's organ, organ transplantation capital. If any of your loved ones have suffered from breast cancer, HIV, or diabetes, Pitt may well have played a role in extending their lives. Scientific advancements to combat our most cruel diseases like ALS, Parkinson's, and HIV depend on the study of human tissue and fetal tissue. Attacks on that research and those who perform it are simply not compatible with the protection of life. To value and to protect life is to support and celebrate the work of our scientists and medical experts. I hope that we in this committee can work together to get this conversation back on track. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative uh, Frankel. Uh, uh, David, uh, would you like to respond to that, and would you like to respond as to how you came about receiving the information uh, regarding the, <clears throat> the, the current research that has been publicized regarding removing the baby scalps and being sewed on the rodents. How did you obtain that information, sir? Sure. So, so there's maybe three, three things there um, if, that, that I would like to uh, address if I could. The first is um, uh, Representative Frankel brought up uh, Planned Parenthood's lawsuit against myself and, and my colleagues. Um, and uh, Representative Frankel described it as uh, as, as a, a, a lawsuit where we were found liable for doctoring videos. Uh, that's entirely false. Planned Parenthood brought no defamation claim. They brought no uh, slander or libel claim uh, whatsoever. Um, they brought uh, basically a, a fraud claim, saying that they were defrauded because we didn't actually buy body parts from them. Um, I'm still trying to figure that one out, but uh, but the um, the veracity of that footage was never questioned um, in the uh, in the forensic process of that uh, of that case. And in fact, the Planned Parenthood officials themselves admitted and stipulated that they spoke the exact words that they're shown speaking on my undercover footage, um, and uh, and it's you know available in all of its. Uh, uh, in all of its forensic validity um, uh, at the California Attorney General's office now, too. Um, additionally, uh, 
you know, it's it's simply uh, not true that um, that every judge or every case where where um, these issues or that evidence has been brought forward has found that there was uh, no wrongdoing in the fetal tissue harvesting or nothing there. Um, the two of Planned Parenthood's oldest business partners in the sale of fetal tissue, the Da Vinci Bioscience companies, were shut down in a $7.8 million settlement by local law enforcement directly as a result of my undercover reporting. And they were being supplied by a Planned Parenthood official who was trained at the University of Pittsburgh. As far as where the uh, current information comes from about the scalping study, and the other uh, studies and the other fetal experimentation projects being done at the University of Pittsburgh. All of that is open source information. Um, the video camera certainly doesn't lie, but you don't even have to take the word of my video camera for it. Um, that comes uh, directly from, um, from public NIH sources and from the published words and the published work of Pitt scientists themselves. Uh, thank you. So the photos that we would have in front of us, those are in published journals, just like the information of the uh, research that was done in Sicily and, and or Italy, uh, that was published as well uh, by Dr. Gerlach. Yes, all, all of that's been published. By himself. So um, thank you for that. Uh, if we have any. Uh, Representative Allett. Thank you, and uh, thank you, David, for being here. Um, I, I, you know, you're shining light into dark places, and that can, you know, make people uncomfortable at times, but I appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, thank you. I, I'm holding in my hand a Representative Matt Baker pen, um, uh, which I find ironic as we're talking about the Abortion Control Act and some some of the great work that he did uh, while he was here. I actually serve in his, uh, his uh, former district. Um, and a lot of the regulations um, that, that came about because of the Gosnell stuff, they, they were voted on and there were people that voted against those regulations that call that work horrific now. And I think that's worth pointing out. Um, what evidence, we're talking about the liver studies and the harvesting and the experiments, what um, what evidence is there that that this practice is still happening or happening or happened here in Pennsylvania? You you touched briefly on that in your testimony. Could you go into that a, a little bit more in depth, please? Thank you. Definitely. So um, uh, so the uh, so the the liver harvesting work that Dr. Gerlach and his colleagues did. Um, Pitt has tried to say so far that this this only ever happened in southern Italy and it ended years ago in 2013. Um, that uh, it, that seems uh, very hard to believe or uh, to believe that or take Pitt at their word on that because Dr. Gerlach and his colleagues, the same ones who developed the, the labor induction abortion liver harvesting protocol and published about it as an Italian thing, um, as recently as 2019, they, were, they, have, they have published studies in the United States referencing uh, whole and complete fetal livers that they are getting from abortions done in Pittsburgh. And they, and, they, and they describe in these studies from 2019 the massive number of stem cells that they're able to extract from these fetal livers that they're getting in Pittsburgh. And they're saying it's, um, it, it, it's getting up to 2 billion stem cells per fetal liver, 20-week fe aborted fetal liver that they're able to obtain. And that was the whole point of the intact labor induction of a living fetus, harvesting the liver as soon as, you, as soon after as you cut the umbilical cord. The whole point of that nightmarish protocol that they developed and published on in 2012 was that they were able to obtain this unprecedentedly huge number of stem cells on the order of 2 billion stem cells from the fetal liver if they did it that way. And so now, you know, six, seven years later in 2019, they're describing getting that same unprecedentedly high number of stem cells from intact fetal livers harvested in Pittsburgh in the United States. So to me, that's a clear indication that they are practicing the same technique here in America that they publicly described as going on in Italy. And it's based on the numbers, correct? I mean, the, the numbers, obviously the numbers don't lie and, and the amount of stem cells, that's why you're basing this, right? Yes, exactly. 
Cool. Well, thank you for, for being here. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. I appreciate um, what, you, what you're doing and the work that you're doing, and, um, um, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Zimmerman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. DeLayden, for your testimony and joining us here today. So Pitt says that uh, their uh, fetal tissue research is in compliance with all state and federal laws and regulations. So apart from the gruesomeness of this taxpayer-funded work, are there reasons to be concerned whether these experiments violate the law? And if so, what, what would some of those be? Yeah, definitely. So there's there's about three or four areas of concern um, that uh, that I that I would encourage um, I'd encourage the the committee to look at um, with the fetal experimentation projects going on at the University of Pittsburgh. The first, as we've been talking about, is this liver harvesting protocol. Um, that uh, that that uh, clearly is going to involve um, infants being delivered alive specifically for organ harvesting. Um, even if there is some uh, some way that perhaps they never put in their published work and they've been kind of keeping secret from everybody for a couple of years now, that somehow those are not um, infants actually being born alive or, or not surviving after birth. Um, the protocol itself would still um, still indicates that this is basically an experimental protocol being carried out on um, fetuses that are still alive, either while they're in the womb or while they're being born. Um, and so that is uh, that you know there's that's a um, that's a third degree felony under the Abortion Control Act is experimentation on a living fetus, whether uh, before the abortion or being born alive through the abortion. Um, that's one big area of concern. Another big area of concern is in the scalping study specifically, the fact that uh, fetal scalps uh, were being used in that study. That means that the fetal heads would have needed to be intact enough to obtain the scalps off of them, um, which would be an indication like Dr. Altman uh, was testifying about earlier this morning. Um, that those might be partial birth abortion cases in order to get an intact fetal skull um, out of the patient in one of those later um, later second trimester procedures. I think there's also um, a serious cause for concern about um, consideration on a quid pro quo basis being traded between the abortion providers and the university um, or between the university and, and um, perhaps the NIH or others. Um, due especially to the market forces that seem to be coming into play for the supply of fetal tissue and fetal organs at Pitt. Um, I'd point especially to the grant application from Pitt for the GoodMap project, um, where they are, where they're advertising explicitly the, um, the availability of the, of the numbers and the volume numbers that, uh, that they have from abortion providers in Pittsburgh. Um, and describing how they're disappointed that they only got a certain number of fetuses in the prior year, presumably because that's the only amount of consents they were able to get from, from pregnant patients. Um, but they want to, quote, ramp it up to try to meet the demand. And they're looking at the, their total patient volume and trying to see how much more, how many, how much more can they pound the pavement in the operating room to try to get as many more fetal specimens for transfer as possible. Um, so the serious uh, demand, um, the serious use demand um, that's present there, um, to me, is an indication that uh, you know that there's valuable consideration or a quid pro quo situation going on explicitly for fetal tissue. Um, and then the fourth big area of concern would just be the consenting in general, um, whether there's actually valid and fully informed um, non-coercive patient consent that's being uh, obtained. Um, for these different research projects, um, certainly, you know, I, I don't know that Pitt has ever produced any copies of the consent forms actually being used, but um, it's probably highly likely that they did not tell them specifically that the scalps were going to be stitched onto lab rodents to keep them growing. Um, and that seems like that would be a relevant material fact for a pregnant couple or a pregnant woman to know um, when being asked to, uh, you know, to, to donate so-called tissue for so-called research. So those are probably the four big areas of uh, legal or regulatory concern with fetal experimentation at Pitt. Born alive infants, partial birth abortions, and changing the abortion practice, um, quid pro quo exchanges of consideration explicitly um, tying, uh, uh, tying the exchange to, um, to a specific fetal product 
to be produced, um, and then the uh, and then the um, the validity of the consent for the patients. Yeah, th thank you for that. Uh, very very traveling in light of uh, you know as legislators we uh, do fund Pitt and others, and so very concerning. But uh, appreciate uh, appreciate the the, the the comments. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Borowitz. Thank you, Chairwoman. Is he still there? Okay. Uh, thank you for being here. I appreciate your work, uh, what you're doing, and revealing the darkness. And sure. uh, obviously, they don't want that scene, what you're doing, so I appreciate it. Uh, so keep going, doing what you're doing. Um, my question would be what would you recommend and next steps for appropriate oversight by officials in Pennsylvania? Thank you. Um, so uh, one one thing that I noticed looking at the Abortion Control Act um, is that as far as um, as far as enforcement over um, uh, quid pro quo sales of fetal tissue, um, exchanges of consideration or valuable consideration, sale of aborted fetal body parts, enforcement um, for uh, enforcement for those rules and those laws uh, falls under the uh, purview of the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Um, which, as we know from the Kermit Gosnell case, um, uh, a lot of the outrages that we saw in the Gosnell case were due directly to um, a, a, a lack of the Department of Health actually exercising their full, their full oversight, following up on very serious and very troubling allegations that for years uh, were, um, were being lodged with them about uh, Dr. Gosnell's practice, and yet they did nothing. Mm. Um, so I think really following up with the Department of Health and making sure that they are in for, that, that they are using their oversight and enforcement authority in these areas is, I think, really crucial. I, you know, it might sadly be the case that they may never have actually investigated um, fetal experimentation uh, or fetal tissue transfers in the state of Pennsylvania, um, which would be pretty concerning. Um, and uh, also, um, for uh, for uh, legislative bodies like this one or other committees um, in the Commonwealth that have subpoena power or have the ability to make actual document requests um, or actual specific witness requests of PIT um, and abortion providers like Planned Parenthood of Western Pennsylvania um, in the Commonwealth. I think it's um, I think it's you know there can you know uh, entities like PIT can send you know the new guy who's been there for five months to testify about something that he says he's not involved in, you know, they can do that for a long time and it doesn't really move the conversation forward. So I think um, I think it's really crucial for the for the entities and the and the bodies of officials like this one that have um, either subpoena power or document uh, request authority um, to actually get some real real information and real evidence to uh, to back up the talking points that are being um, that are being spread by you know by lobbyists for organizations like that so those those would be my big recommendations right now great thank you David I want I want to thank you very much for being here this is uh, uh, and I know it's controversial um, but that's a lot of what this committee does and uh, we've heard a lot of information uh, since we've done the hearings and I truly appreciate your time um, you did mention, I'll just, I think we have time for like just, you did mention uh, the University of Penn and uh, alluded to their, that they host abortion training. Anything else regarding any of the, any more in depth regarding the University of Penn or any of our other universities or research facilities? Yeah, I think uh, I think this committee actually heard uh, testimony from one of the abortion providers um, at uh, at Penn, um, who is part of the uh, part of the abortion training program at Penn. Um, that uh, that fetal tissue and organ harvesting is something that they do um, at the uh, you know in the abortion program at Penn. So, um, so, uh, so there's not just, it's not just that there are scientists at Penn who are doing fetal tissue projects with NIH funding, but they're getting some of those fetuses apparently from abortion providers who are part of that abortion training program at Penn that is done in partnership with the local Planned Parenthood affiliate over in Philadelphia. So it's a fact pattern that starts to look, you know, kind of like a mirror image of what's going on in Pittsburgh. Um, so I think, uh, I think that that's uh, I think that's something that that deserves further scrutiny. 
Thank you so much uh, for, for your time. And uh, I know you're over in the uh, West Coast. We're here. Uh, thank you for agreeing to be with us. I do know that you released a video yesterday. I believe uh, the Family Institute has uh, released that and shared that uh, for anyone who wants to view it you know, further. What uh, the experiments at Pittsburgh, they are disturbing. Uh, but I, I truly appreciate your forthrightness and your, your honesty and, and being here. You've certainly been through a lot. And uh, I want to thank the members. I had asked from the very beginning that we would all be respectful through all of this, that you would have time to answer your questions. And I, I do appreciate uh, the respectfulness of the committee to our testifiers. And uh, thank you again, David. And with that, I believe we will adjourn. We are in session at 11. So thank you very much, David, for being with us today. Thank you, staff, thank you for, the for everything. Thank you, David. The hearing is adjourned.